Hello everyone. In this video we'll be taking a look at kitchens, which um, just so happen to be uh, the most expensive room in the home, at least most homes. So we'll be looking at some historical precedents, the kitchen work triangle, designing with zones, basic styles, and kitchen islands. So first some historical precedents. So historically, you know, kitchens weren't luxurious, they weren't entertaining spaces, they weren't, you know, kind of the place to be in a house, you know, especially for, you know, guests and entertaining and things like that. Um, you know, thinking way back, uh, they were dark, they were, um, you know, kind of dirty, they were filled with noises, you know, smells, they were hot very often, maybe catching on fire, you know, they, they weren't what we think of today. They were extremely busy, um, you know, probably uncomfortable, hot, you know, all of that. So, you know, kitch kitchens traditionally, you know, tended to be kind of far away from, you know, the social or, you know, the private rooms, um, you know, in a home. So here we're looking at, you know, some 16th and 18th century homes, um, both in England um, and in New England as well. So, you know, as, as time went on, they became more attractive, of course, and more hospitable. But still, it you know, for a long time that, you know, that wasn't the case. So beginning in the early 1900s, ergonomics, uh, you know, started to come into play. Um, it's also the time of the Industrial Revolution. So we have new inventions, uh, cheaper prices, new ways of thinking about um, economic and ergonomic efficiency. Um, gas at this time became the preferred source of heat, you know, allowing ovens to become smaller and lighter, you know, not actual wood burning um, and that type of thing. Uh, actually, over here on the right, we see a study in ergonomics in 1926, the Frankfurt Kitchen, uh, which aimed to make kitchens, uh, you know, kitchen tasks, the, you know, simplest and quickest uh, and easiest as possible um, in seeing above um, the Hoosier cabinets from the early 1900s. So really trying to be as efficient and attractive, uh, you know, as we could in that space. Uh, moving forward, you know, just taking a kind of a brief look at what some, you know, his, traditionally historical, you know, kitchens may have looked like in the 30s. On the left, you know, still with a very different looking um, type of stove, um, you know, things still being kind of more freestanding looking, uh, you know, more built into the plaster, you know, this th that kind of um, look so very different moving into the 40s on the right um, you know notice the patterns and the colors that you know we just don't necessarily think of today um, the metal legs on the furniture the hand sewn kind of polka dots um, you know and that pink kind of cabinetry it's very different right moving into the 50s and then 60s you know slowly but surely things are starting to get a little more modern um, you know but certainly you know still more colorful than a typical residential kitchen might have today uh, you know the image on the right you know certainly becoming much more uh, you know modern contemporary with the clean lines that we might be used to seeing at this point uh, but still has that you know quote, vintage type of look with the materials, the handles, uh, and things like that. Um, and also, you know, as we look at these spaces, you know, we're seeing like the cabinets are up a little higher than we might deem to be ergonomic at this point. So on the way to a contemporary kitchen, but still a little bit different. And, you know, moving into the 70s and 80s and today, we start to see the kitchens that we, you know, recognize more, um, you know, with the central islands, more cabinetry, um, you know, and things like that. So, you know, over time, kitchens, you know, become part of the main part of the house, if you will. Uh, but then they also become a focal point. They become a place of entertainment, of you know, socialization where everyone kind of wants to be. So the way they are laid out, the way they look and feel becomes very different. So first, the work triangle, as we think about a kitchen as a functional space, you know, it's intended purpose of preparing food, right? So the concept of the work triangle was developed by the Small Homes Council of the School of Architecture at the University of Illinois in the 40s. Um, so seeing, you know, another kind of colorful kitchen of that era, be pretty fun to have all of your appliances and everything be pink, I, I certainly think. Um, and so this whole idea is about creating an efficient, functional layout 
uh, in the kitchen. So kitchens can have you know four main kind of shapes or layouts. Really thinking about the galley, L shape, U shape, and G shape, or that peninsula idea. So on the left, we're seeing a standard galley look. So galley is just you know two parallel um, you know sections of the kitchen um, and the work triangle kind of fitting in between. So thinking about you know working between the sink, the cooking service, and the refrigerator to create that that triangle. So galleys are very efficient. Um, but we tend, you know, to not have a lot of counter space, depending on the size, of course. Uh, and if somebody else besides, the, you know, the person cooking comes through that space, it can be quite disruptive, right? Because they're really going to come through right where you're working. The L shape um, is very popular, very common, um, you know, and with this kind of configuration between the sink the cooking surface and the refrigerator if somebody's walking through that space they're probably not going to cross paths with the person cooking um, so that you know they can work out a little bit better um, and you generally get more counter space with a layout like this especially from the galley the u-shape uh, you know gives us another another leg on that l-shape design uh, really surrounding the cook with the appliances so you know generally speaking we have the refrigerator on one wall the sink on another and the cooking the stove the oven on another yet so this can be super efficient give you a lot of counter space um, and if you have a big enough space you can get an island in there it can be really quite ideal and then finally we have the G shape which is essentially the U shape with the addition of that peninsula so um, getting even more counter space um, it can kind of have this cozy sort of quality and really what it does is you know if we have that peninsula as a, you know either storage or where people can pull up and sit um, you really get sort of this commonality between the kitchen and the dining room and kind of a nice connection point it can be really nice for entertaining and things like that Closer look at that work triangle. Um, so if we're looking on the left there, we'll see that for any leg of that triangle, we don't want it to be any longer than nine feet from one point to the next, from the sink to the cooktop, for example, and no shorter than four feet. Uh, you know, we don't want to get a situation where it's really far in between one thing and another and then really too close and uncomfortable on the other end. And when we think about that triangle, it's a clear path from one point to the next. So if we look at the image on the right here, that does not mean that we can notch around this island, for example. So, you know, simply by pushing that refrigerator down a little bit, right, we no longer have that clear path and you would actually have to walk up and turn. Right. So that is not an efficient use of space that wouldn't actually be very pleasant at all um, in your kitchen. That would be very awkward. So we don't want any conditions where that triangle leg, that line is going through something that's that's not actually um, functioning properly. So just a few examples of some of the different types of kitchen configurations and what those can look like. So the configurations are not really about style, right? So you could have any style in any configuration, but really how they how they look and function. So some galley style uh, kitchens here, you know, seeing how that is basically a long corridor uh, with cabinetry, counter, and then your appliances on either side. Again, in different configurations. Um, you can be very traditional, very contemporary, and the width of that, um, you know, that space in between, you know, the closer it is, the more cozy, um, and, you know, the less distance you have to walk with things. The further apart that gets, you know, yes, you can get a lot more people in there, but then you are, you know, walking further in between the sink, the stove, the refrigerator, and so on. G-shaped example here, again, meaning that peninsula aspect. So you could have, um, you know, bookcases, storage, whatever that connection might be. It could be a counter height scenario, um, you know, many, many different options, but kind of showing what that might look like. Okay, a U-shape example here, you know, again, seeing that ability to be sort of surrounded um, by your cooking points and countertop and cabinetry and everything. So is the work triangle 
always a good thing? Is it always how you need to think about designing a kitchen? Well, the work triangle assumes that a kitchen will only have three major workstations, right? The cooking surface, the sink, the refrigerator, and one person cooking. Uh, as the kitchen grows in size, the regular work triangle isn't always practical. So it really just depends on the context and the size of the kitchen. So if you have a larger kitchen where multiple people will be sharing cooking duties, for example, a simple work triangle isn't always the only way to think about it. So we can also be designing within zones. If we're thinking about designing within zones, we really want to be thinking about consumables, non-consumables, the cleaning area, the prep area, and the cooking area. So when you think about the consumable zone, you know, that's where you're storing your food, the consumable things that are in your kitchen, right? So you may actually think about this as even being split into two zones. So one for fresh food, you know, things that are being refrigerated, so your refrigerator and freezer, and then one for, you know, dry goods, um, things like that. It's so like your pantry or your cabinetry that will actually be holding the, you know, the long-term types of foods. Then we also have the consumable storage zone. So this is where you're getting into your dishes, your plates, glasses, um, you know, all of your pots and pans potentially, things like that. You have your cleaning zone, which of course will be your sink and, you know, dishwasher if you're lucky enough to have one. Then you have your prep zone, um, the area where, you know, most of your meal prep happens. So, um, you know, it's the stretch of countertop where you do all the chopping and combining and mixing and all of that, um, which may just, you know, be along the perimeter. Um, that may also be on a kitchen island. And then we can also be thinking about the cooking zone. So the cooking zone is, you know, the stovetop. It's also the oven or it could be the combined range and you can also be thinking about like the microwave in there as well. Uh, I really kind of enjoy this very overly staged uh, image with all of that fresh food just you know out and about. Um, so you know thinking about all of these zones we want to think about the ideal proximity of these so that we have you know comfort we can cook we can move around we can clean but then it can't be too far apart because all of a sudden things are very awkward to get to so for this example you know it's big and spacious and we have all of these um, you know storage you know areas for our dishes and things however if you're actually using this space you know the refrigerator is built up against the wall and then you have to kind of walk into the kitchen and it's kind of you have to travel all over for your things and then also you know having um, glass doors for all of your storage can be wonderful and it can be a great thing but it also means that you can see everything um, so a clear glass door means you better have some very organized uh, cabinets and shelves because um, you can see it all unless you're not bothered <laughs> by that um, you know and so as we look at these different kitchens you know even though this one might be a little bit more compact um, it's much more user friendly in terms of you know grabbing things from the refrigerator taking it to the counter to you know chop it up and things like that the, um, the actual usability of this is much more friendly and then here even though we have some exposed dishes and things like that you know it's it's just a few um, the cabinets are actually smaller, so you might only put one or two items per shelf, which just by nature stays more organized. Um, you know, and then having that open plate storage up above can be really handy as you wash dishes. You can put them right up above your head. So um, some nice features in, you know, a modestly sized kitchen. So just thinking, you know, quickly about kitchen styles and some, you know, what are some of the big ones? What are the big looks? Well, first of all, traditional kitchens. So traditional kitchens tend to have a very formal, um, you know, possibly elegant type of look. Um, and they, you know, are kind of mimicking those, you know, looks from Europe and America is in that 18th to 20th century. So we see on the cabinetry a lot of that crown molding, uh, corbels, and like other kinds of ornamentation and trim work. And, you know, they're kind of elaborate in a sense. Generally, the doors have a raised panel. Um, and they may be painted or they may actually be in wood tones, you know, cherry, walnut, mahogany, um, you know, oak, possibly, things like that. Um, you know, and, and generally we have a lot of wood. Um, we may have stone, tile, um, and you might start to see kind of like vintage 
reproductions of lighting and things like that. So it has kind of a a thick and heavy appearance. And so, you know, this kitchen, we have, you know, it's big windows and counter space and all this, but it does have sort of a very, you know, kind of heavy, heavy look to it. A lot of repetition of that same material, same color tone, very tan um, and green, um, kind of bulky. So, you know, here would be an example of a traditional kitchen, again, you know, with the crown molding and, and details in, in the woodwork and that, um, but it's lighter, you know, it, it's a little bit more cheerful. Um, and then we're seeing a little bit, you know, more contrast, a contrast between the appliances, and the cabinetry. Um, we're also seeing, you know, a contrast with the floor and the cabinetry, a different countertop on the island. So it's a little bit more dynamic. Another example of a traditional style kitchen as well. This one is very large and very open, uh, very much open to the living space. Um, and, you know, this is a very interesting design, probably, you know, having some refrigerator drawers in here. Very different look. And it's, you know, so large, in fact, that we actually have multiple islands. Um, so it's almost like you're kind of setting the stage, which you know, might work for some people, you know, might be kind of a, you know, peculiar use of space for others, um, you know, depending on, on how you entertain and, and live. Uh, we can also have, you know, contemporary kitchens, kind of other end of the spectrum, uh, you know, from traditional. So, Contemporary kitchens might be described as modern, geometric, minimalist, you know, and really the influences here um, you know, are Scandinavian. We often see these coming from Italy and Germany, actually. Um, and so we tend to look at cabinetry that's frameless, um, very minimal, no crown molding, um, very, very, very simple. The cabinetry doors tend to be slab, um, you know, often either laminated or maybe in, you know, a very smooth um, type of wood. Uh, you know, here for materials, we may have stainless steel, laminate, glass, Concrete, chrome, lacquer finishes are super common. Um, and we could either have integrated hardware so that you really don't see the hardware, it's sort of part of the door and kind of hidden. Or you may actually have like oversized hardware, um, but it would still very, be very sleek um, and contemporary in appearance. So, you know, seeing different finishes, but, you know, very, um, very often a contemporary kitchen is quite rectilinear um, and kind of has these kind of masses and forms, although they can certainly be curvilinear as well. Um, and then we can have a transitional kitchen, and that would be the in-between, between transitional and a contemporary kitchen is um, or traditional and uh, and modern. So we have transitional as that in-between. So you can kind of think of that as being um, eclectic, right? So it's a mix of that traditional look, that modern look, and it's somewhere in between. So, you know, we're mixing man-made materials and natural materials. You know, we're seeing some um, crown molding, perhaps some detail, like a little bit of ornamentation, but overall things tend to be a little bit on the simple side. Uh, but, you know, there will be a little bit more embellishment, um, you know, a little bit more of that kind of possibly whimsical vibe. You know, it's a little less um, stern feeling maybe, um, you know, in terms of materials, lighting, um, and there's a little bit more character to it than just a straight modern kitchen. Okay, so also then thinking about um, kitchen islands a little bit. So we, you know, we have our perimeter countertops and cabinetry, um, you know, where most of our, you know, appliances and things tend to be. But the kitchen island, um, if there's space, can be a really wonderful thing in a kitchen. So even a small kitchen island really requires a lot of space. Um, so, you know, not every kitchen is going to have um, have the ability to have an island, but if you can get in an island, um, you know, think about using it for, you know, serving purposes other than just a countertop and some cabinetry. You know, there could be storage, but there can also be cooking, right? We can have the range in there. We can have the oven. We can have the sink, you know, all sorts of possibilities. So the island really can help define the design of the kitchen. Um, you know, it needs to fit the shape of the room and, you know, the personality of the owners, and then it can really be quite a statement piece you know in this example we're seeing that you know it's painted a different color it has a different character and it's really sort of the focal point 
of the kitchen. And so as we think about how that lays out in the floor plan, we want to make sure that it's integrated and fits into the space, but then we have plenty of room to travel around. So thinking about having that four foot space in between is a nice, healthy uh, pathway. You know, here's another example. So in that smaller image on the upper left, we're seeing, you know, a, a smaller, daintier type of island um, that you can have. It's movable. You know, it's not really like built into the space. It's just, you know, a storage unit. You can do some food prep on it. Uh, the one in the larger image on the right is, um, you know, still has that freestanding idea that we see it, that it's up on feet, but it's much larger. You know, you wouldn't actually be moving that around. It has some built in, bar height seating, it's painted a different color. We once again, a focal point, and this primarily used for eating and prepped work again. And if we look at the floor plan, um, you know, we're seeing that here we have that three foot six path going around um, in that kind of drawing idea. So, you know, getting in a small kind of narrow island in that space offers extra counter surface, landing surface, and still a comfortable path of travel. Um, you know, just thinking about kitchen islands, uh, it's worth bringing up the Johnny Gray Island. Um, the design firm does really fantastic, super interesting work, and they're all custom, you know, custom for each project, and they can get very, you know, curvilinear and interesting, you know, working in these multi-level counter surfaces, you know, for prep, for cleaning, for cooking, um, and, you know, really, really wonderful custom design that adds so much to the space and really becomes, you know, the focal point of this entire living area. Uh, so just kind of looking at, you know, some kitchens again and different um, island shapes and how that impacts the space. So, you know, using the island, perhaps like on the upper left in a key color, you know, really being bold, um, really adds, you know, life to that space. Very contemporary, high gloss, high lacquer kind of look there. Um, upper right, still extremely contemporary, you know, showing that waterfall edge on the countertops with that raised bar height seating and then the refrigeration and cabinetry all very seamless in the background there uh, in all those high gloss panels. Then at the bottom in the lower right, you know, we're seeing that floating um, countertop look along the wall, which has a really neat modern element and a really neat massing in that kitchen. Again, with the island floating, you know, about four feet away from it, um, we're seeing that island hood coming down over the cooking surface that's so contemporary that it's just basically a rectangle um, with those waterfall edges um, again on that countertop very contemporary uh, with the um, wall ovens you know mounted up nice and high at the far end of the room so you know very ergonomic very comfortable and then in the lower left uh, you know, a more um, traditional, transitional, uh, you know, type of option where it's contemporary and that we have the curve and angle and those, um, you know, kind of contemporary bar stools, uh, you know, that kind of a look, but still with that attention to molding detail and all of that and seeing the wine storage mounted um, in the cabinetry, the sink along the back wall. So um, some really exciting, really different looks are possible. And then here, you know, we're seeing a variety of different kitchens, again, all using a similar wood tone, but then having very different looks. So it's just kind of interesting to think about, um, you know, looking at the islands with a great deal of storage here, lots of um, plates and dishes and things, um, and using a translucent material. So you can, you can see in there, get the idea, but not clear, um, you know, so there's not quite so much pressure to have the perfectly organized um, kitchen cabinets, right? Um, and then the lower uh, right, for example, you know, seeing very tall, dramatic, strong cabinetry, a great deal of storage, um, a great deal of cooking opportunities, actually, um, with all of the, you know, coffee makers, wall ovens, um, you know, cooking in the island with an island hood above it. 
again, and then kind of a separate area over here for actually sitting and eating. Um, and all the way on this side then, um, you know, the sink over by the window. So very, very large, expansive kitchen. And then on the lower left, you know, a similar look with, you know, that wood tone, the black countertops and all of that, but different in that we don't have any upper cabinetry here. A couple of shelves, but all of the storage is really down low. Um, and, you know, we actually get to see a much lighter, more open space and get to enjoy those windows. So it is, you know, a possibility to have a different look in a kitchen, um, you know, and not actually have that, you know, upper cabinetry that we usually think of. Few more very contemporary examples, just food for thought on all the different shapes and configurations that are possible in a kitchen. And even thinking of, you know, for example, on this lower right image, that we can have cabinetry that that deep, beautiful red color. We don't just have to think of wood or white. Um, the possibilities are pretty endless in terms of finishes. So that's just a little bit about kitchens.